complete chapter of units and measurement. Well, I will teach you the complete concepts of units and measurement. The first concept of this chapter is physical quantity. Anything which we can measure is called physical quantity. For example, we can measure temperature like 40 degree centigrade. So temperature is a physical quantity. We can measure length of a room like 30 meter. So length is a physical quantity. We can measure time like 5 minutes. So time is a physical quantity. We can measure mass of anything like 2 kg. So mass is a physical quantity. Secondly, we know that we cannot measure happiness. So it is not a physical quantity. We cannot measure sadness. So it is not a physical quantity. Therefore, we say that anything which we can measure is called physical quantity. Remember that every physical quantity has two parts, magnitude and unit. Now what is magnitude and unit? Well, magnitude is a numerical value or simply a number like 40, 30, 10, etc. While unit is used to measure any physical quantity. For example, let I write 10 hours. We can see that 10 is a magnitude and R is a unit. This unit of R tells us about the time. Therefore, remember that magnitude is a numerical value and unit is used to highlight the respective physical quantity. Now we will learn types of units. Remember that there are two types of units. The first one is base units and the second one is derived units. Firstly, what are base units? Well, a set of seven fundamental units and a system of measurement is called base units. The seven base units are second, meter, kilogram, kelvin, mole, ampere, and candela. Note down that second is represented by S, meter is represented by M, kilogram is represented by kg, kelvin is represented by K, Mole is represented by MOL mole, Ampere is represented by A, and Candela is represented by CD. Here, let me teach you my personal trick to remember these seven base units. I say SCKKMMS. Here, A stands for Ampere, C stands for Candela, K stands for Kilogram, this K stands for Kelvin. M stands for meter, this M stands for mole, and this S stands for second. Thus, using my personal trick, we can easily remember the seven base quantities. Now, what are derived units? Well, those units which are derived by multiplication or division of the base units are called derived units. For example, Consider meter and meter. Now I multiply them. I get meter squared. We know that it is a unit of area. We know that this meter and this meter is a base unit. This meter squared is a derived unit because it is derived from multiplication of two base units. Secondly, consider this meter and second. Now I divide them. I get meter per squared. It is a unit of speed. We know that meter and speed both are base units. While this meter per second is a derived unit because it is derived from division of two base units. Thus remember that derived units are those units which are derived from base units. Now we will learn SI units. We know that SI unit stands for System the International Units. In the past, there was a big problem while dealing with units. For example, in the Europe, mass was measured in pound. 
while in asia like pakistan and india mass was measured in sehr it was a problem i mean two different units were used for the same physical quantity mass not to solve this problem of different units international system of units is introduced which we call si units the main purpose of si units was that all units can be easily communicated internationally let me repeat it the main purpose of si units was that all units can be easily communicated internationally now what is si units well the seven base units that have been agreed upon by international agreement is called si units we already know the trick ac kk mms where a stands for ampere c stands for candela k stands for kelvin k stands for kg m stands for meter this m stands for mole and s stands for second these are the seven si units hence noted down this list of si units now we will learn scientific notation firstly let me ask you one important question why we study scientific notation well to save space and to save time we study scientific notation for example the mass of the moon is 7 into 10 raised to the power 22 kg it is a very big number if we write it it will be 700 up to 270 it is too big number now to save space and to save time we use scientific notation we write it in the scientific notation as 7 into 10 raised to the power 22 kg secondly the diameter of an atomic nucleus is 1 into 10 raised to the power minus 14 meter it is a very small number if we write it it is like 0.000 up to 140 it is too small number now to save space and to save time we use scientific notation to write it 1 into 10 raised to the power minus 14 meter Thus remember that we use scientific notation to save space and time. Now we will learn writing scientific notation. Let consider this number. Firstly, we spot the leading digit. Here the leading digit is seven. There is no decimal point present in this number. I put decimal point at the end. Now listen carefully. If I move the decimal point to the left, the exponent or power of the tenth is positive. Here, I move the decimal point to the left. One, two, and three. I leave the living digit seven, and I put decimal point after it. I write seven point two four five into ten. I have moved the decimal point three times to the left. I write positive three. I write positive three as exponent. So I get seven point two four five into ten raised to the power three. This is called scientific notation. Secondly, consider this number. We can see that the leading digit is three. There is no decimal point present in this number. I put decimal point at the end. Now I move the decimal point to the right. One, two, three, and four. I put the decimal point after the leading digit. I write three. Here, all the digits are zero. Remember that we do not write them. We have moved the decimal point four times. I write plus four as an exponent. So I get three into ten. Raised to the power four. This is called scientific notation. Thirdly, consider this number. Here, the decimal point is already present. I move it to the left. One and two. I put it after the leading digit. 
I write 4.863 and to 10. I have moved two times the decimal point to the left. I write 2 as an exponent. I get 4.863 and to 10 raised to the power 2. This is called scientific notation. Now consider this number. Remember that 0 cannot be a leading digit. Let me repeat this important point. Remember that 0 cannot be a leading digit. So here the leading digit is 3. Now listen carefully. If we move decimal point to the right, the exponent will always be negative. Here I move this decimal point to the right. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. I put this decimal point after the leading digit. I write 3.12 and to 10. I have moved the decimal point to the right 5 times. I write minus 5. So I get 3.12 and to 10 raised to the power minus 5. This is called scientific notation. Therefore, using this simple method, we can easily convert any big or small number to a scientific notation. Hence note it down. Now we will learn significant figures. Well, I teach this easy analogy to master significant figure. Let us consider this hungry man. We know that this man needs some sort of food. Because food is important, certain and reliable source to kill his hunger. Secondly, let consider that he adds some sort of fruit to his menu. Here, let me ask you, is fruit that much important to kill his hunger? The answer is no. It is not that much important. But we cannot ignore its importance. I mean, fruit is necessary. Similarly, let consider this table. Let the length of this table is 25.1 cm. Here, before the decimal point, there are two digits. They are certain digits and reliable. Well, after the decimal point, there is only one digit. It is not that much important like fruit. But it is necessary. I mean, we cannot ignore its importance. Thus we say that there are total three important digits and 25.1 cm. Or we say that there are three significant figures and the length of this table. Remember that this length of the table contains certain and necessary digits. Therefore we define significant figure as the certain and necessary digits in any measurement is called significant figure. Let me repeat it. The certain and necessary digits in any measurement is called significant figures. Hence note it down this fundamental concept of significant figures which a lot of students are not understanding. Now I will teach you super easy trick to find significant figure in any measurement. We know that there are two types of numbers, non-decimal numbers and decimal numbers. In non-decimal numbers, to find significant figure, always remember this trick. Go from first non-zero digit to the last non-zero digit. For example, consider these numbers. In this number, the first non-zero digit is 5 and the last non-zero digit is 2. So all these digits are significant figure. I count them. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. Thus there are total 6 significant figures present in 8. Secondly, in this number, the first non-zero digit is 2 and the last non-zero digit is 3. So I go from 2 to 3. 1, 2, 3. Thus there are total 3 significant figures 
present and act. Thirdly, in this number, the first known zero digit is 4 and the last known zero digit is 1. I go from 4 to 1. 1, 2, 3, 4. So there are total 4 significant figures present and act. While in case of decimal numbers, we say that to find significant figures, go from non-zero digit to the last. For example, consider these numbers. In the first number, the first non-zero digit is 5. I go from 5 to the last. 1, 2, 3, 4. Hence, there are 5 significant figures present in this number. In case of second number, the first non-zero digit is 7. I go from 7 to the last. I count them. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. So there are 6 significant figures present in 8. In case of third number, we can see that the first non-zero digit is 4. I go from 4 to the last. I count them. 1, 2, 3, 4. So there are 4 significant figures present in 8. Thus using this trick, we can easily find significant figure in any measurement. If you want to learn more about significant figures, watch our lecture and its link is given in the description. Now we will learn the important concept of accuracy and precision. Accuracy means how close a measurement is to the actual value. For example, consider this man. Let the actual height of this man is 3 meter. Here are these three students. I ask them to find the height of this man. Let the first student measure that the height of this man is 4 meter. Let the second student measure that the height of this man is 2 meter. While the third student measure that the height of this man is 3 meter. Now listen carefully. There are three different values in this measurement. The two values are totally wrong. But one value is correct. So we say that this is accurate measurement or it has high accuracy. It is because this third value of the measurement is intersecting the actual value. Thus remember that even if one value in a measurement is matching, the actual value, we say that it is accurate or it has high accuracy. On the other hand, precision means how two or more values in a measurement are close to each other. For example, consider this man from the previous example. Let the actual height of this man is 3 meter. Now I ask these three more students to measure the height of this man. Let the first student measure that it is 2.5 meter. The second student measure it, it is 2.4 meter. And the third student measure it, 2.6 meter. Here, let me ask you, is this measurement accurate or it has high accuracy? The answer is no. It has low accuracy or it is not accurate because the values in the measurement do not match the actual value. Hence we say that it has low accuracy. But here this 2.5 meter is close to 2.4 meter and this 2.4 meter is close to 2.6 meter. These measured values are close to each other hence this measurement has high precision. Let me repeat it. These measured values are close to each other, hence this measurement has high precision. Therefore, we say that this measurement has low accuracy but high precision. Hence, note down these important concepts. Now, I will teach you some questions based on the concept of accuracy and precision. Let's consider that a scale measures the mass of an apple as 
constantly is 0.5 kg less than the actual mass. Which option is correct? Well, the scale is constantly measuring 0.5 kg, 0.5 kg and 0.5 kg less than. So this measurement has high precision because all these values are close to each other. Secondly, the scale is measuring the mass of an apple less than the actual value, so it is not accurate. Or we say that it has low accuracy. Thus the correct option is C. Precise but not accurate. Secondly, consider this question. The mass of a bag is 10.5 kg. A student measured it as 10.5 kg, 10.6 kg and 9.5 kg. Firstly, this is accurate measurement because the actual value 10.5 kg is matching the measured value 10.5 kg. Hence, this measurement is accurate or it has high accuracy. Secondly, 10.5 kg is nearer to 10.6 kg. But 10.6 kg is away from 9.5 kg. The three measured values are not close to each other. Hence, it is not precise or it has low precision. Thus, the correct option is accurate but not precise. Hence, note it down these important questions. Now, I will teach you the super easy concept of dimensional formula. It is super easy. Let's consider these important base quantities like mass, length, time and current. We know that the SI unit of mass is kg, that of length is meter, that of time is second and that of current is ampere. The dimensional symbol of mass is m, length is l, time is t and current is a. Using these dimensional symbols, we can easily find dimensional formula of any quantity. For example, find the dimensional formula of velocity, acceleration and force. Well, we know that velocity is equal to displacement upon time. Now the dimensional symbol of displacement or length is L and that of time is T. I write L upon T. Our square bracket L into T raised to the power minus 1 square bracket closed. Also we can write square bracket m raised to the power 0 into L into T raised to the power minus 1 square bracket closed. Here this m raised to the power 0 means that the dimensional formula has no mass. Thus, this is the dimensional formula of velocity. Secondly, we know that acceleration is equal to change in velocity upon time. We already learned that velocity is equal to displacement upon time upon this time. I write the dimensional symbol of displacement is L, that of time is T and that of time is again T. I get square bracket L n2 t raised to the power minus 2 square bracket. Thus this is the dimensional formula of acceleration. Thirdly, in case of force, we know that force is equal to mass and to acceleration. The dimensional symbol of mass is m. We already calculated the dimensional formula of acceleration which is L into T raised to the power minus 2. I get square bracket M into L into T raised to the power minus 2 square bracket. This is the dimensional formula of force. Note it down all these dimensional formulae because we will use them in the next slide. Now consider this question. Find the dimensional formula of pressure, stress, and modulus of elasticity. Well, we know that pressure is equal to force upon area. Our pressure is equal to force upon 
area is equal to length and to breadth. We know that the dimensional formula of force is m into l into t raised to the power minus 2. Upon the dimensional symbol of length is l and the dimensional symbol of breadth is also l. Now this l and this l cancel out. I get square bracket m into l raised to the power minus 1 n to t raised to the power minus 2 square bracket. Thus this is the dimensional formula of pressure. Secondly, in case of stress, we know that it is equal to force upon area. We have already calculated the dimensional formula force upon area which is square bracket m n to l raised to the power minus 1 and to t raised to the power minus 2 square bracket. Thus this is the dimensional formula of stress. Thirdly, in case of modulus of elasticity, it is equal to stress upon strain. We know that strain is unitless. Hence elasticity is equal to stress. We already calculated the dimensional formula of stress which is square bracket m into l minus 1 t into minus 2 square bracket. Thus this is the dimensional formula of modulus of elasticity. Therefore remember that pressure, stress and model of elasticity have the same dimensional formulae. Hence note it down. Now consider this question. Find the dimensional formula of work done, energy, torque and kinetic energy. Well, we know that work done is the dot product of force and distance. The dimensional formula of force is m into l into t raised to the power minus 2. The dimensional symbol of length is l. I get square bracket m into l squared and to t raised to the power minus 2 square bracket. Thus this is the dimensional formula of work done and energy. Remember that work done and energy are the two faces of the same coin. Secondly, we know that torque is the cross product of force and distance. The dimensional formula of force is m into l into t raised to the power minus 2. The dimensional symbol of length is L. I get square bracket m into L squared into t raised to the power minus 2 square bracket. Thus this is the dimensional formula of torque. Thirdly, we know that kinetic energy is equal to half of mv squared. Remember that we do not consider constant like 1 by 2 and finding dimensional formula. We know that dimensional symbol of mass is m. The dimensional formula of V is L into T minus 1. I take square on 8. I get square bracket m into L squared into T raised to the power minus 2 square bracket. Thus this is the dimensional formula of kinetic energy. Therefore, remember that burden, energy, torque and kinetic energy all have the same dimensional formulae. Hence, note it down this easy concept of dimensional formula. Now, we will learn measurement of length. We know that here are two methods to measure length. Direct method and indirect method. We use direct method to measure length when both ends are approachable. For example, consider this pencil. We can touch the end of the pencil, so we use meter scale to find its length. Remember that the least count of a meter rule is 1 millimeter. By least count, I mean the smallest length which is measured with the instrument. The second instrument is vernier caliper. Its least count is 0.1 mm. The third instrument is screw gauge. Its least count is 0.01 mm. On the other hand, we used indirect method to measure the length when both ends are not approachable. For example, 
The indirect method is parallax method. We use this method to find large distance between two heaven bodies, like distance between the earth and the moon. The second indirect method is reflexive method. Now let me teach you the important concept of parallax method. Firstly, let me teach you that what is parallax method. Consider this pencil. Here, look at the pencil. Now close your left eye. Next, open your left eye and close your right eye. Then repeat this process quickly. You can observe that the pencil shift from left to right and vice versa. This shift is due to the distance between your two eyes. We call it apparent shift or parallax method. Therefore, we define parallax method as the apparent shift in the position of object when viewed from different positions is called parallax method. Remember that Parallax method is used to measure large distance. For example, the method is used to measure the distance between the earth and the moon. Now I will teach you how mathematically we understand parallax method. Let consider this circle. Here I draw this sector. We know that this is radius r and this is arc length l. It extends in angle theta at the center. Remember that the angle theta is always measured in radian. Let me repeat it. The angle theta is always measured in radian. According to the equation, theta is equal to arc length upon radius. Our theta is equal to L upon R. Using this equation, we can easily measure large distance. For example, consider this numerical problem. The moon is observed from two points A and B on the earth. The angle theta subtended at the moon by the two points of observation is 1 degree 54 minute. The diameter of the earth is about 1.276 and to 10 raised to the power 7 meter. Find the distance of the moon from the earth. Well. I draw a freehand diagram for it. Consider the moon and the earth. Let the diameter of the earth is L. It subtended an angle theta at the moon. Let the distance between the earth and the moon is R. Now I write the given data. The angle subtended at the moon theta is equal to 1 degree 54 minute. Secondly, the diameter of the earth L is 1.276 and to 10 raised to the power 7 meter. We are asked to find the distance of the moon from the earth, which is r and it is unknown. Here, remember that 360 degree is equal to 2 pi radian, 180 degree is equal to pi radian, 1 degree is equal to pi upon 180 radian and 1 degree is equal to 60 minute. We can see that the angle theta is given in degree minutes. We need to convert it to radians. In the first step, I will convert minute to degree. The value of theta is 1 degree and 54 minute. I convert 54 minute to degree. We know that in 1 degree, there are 60 minute. Then in 54 minute, there are x degree. After cross multiplication, I get 60x is equal to 54 into 1. Our x is equal to 54 upon 60. Our x is equal to 0 0.9 degree. Thus in 54 minute, there are 0 0.9 degree. I write 1 degree plus. Instead of 54 minute, I write 0 0.9 degree. After addition, I get theta is equal to 1.9 degree. In the second step, I will convert degree to radian. The value of theta is 1.9 degree. We know that in 1 degree, 
टेर इज पाई बाई वन एटी रेडियन देन इन वन पॉइंट नाइन डिग्री देर इज पाई रेडियन आफ्टर कैलकुलेशन आई गेट थीटा इज इक्वल टू जीरो पॉइंट जीरो थ्री थ्री टू रेडियन दस वन पॉइंट नाइन डिग्री इज इक्वल टू जीरो पॉइंट जीरो थ्री थ्री टू रेडियन नो अकॉर्डिंग टू द इक्वेशन थीटा इज इक्वल टू एल बाई आर वी नो दैट एल इज द डायामीटर ऑफ द अर्थ आर इज द डिस्टेंस बिटवीन द अर्थ एंड द मून वी आर आस टू फाइंड द डिस्टेंस आर फ्रॉम द अर्थ टू द मून आई शिफ्ट आर फ्रॉम द राइट हैंड साइड टू द लेफ्ट हैंड साइड आई गेट आर इज इक्वल टू एल अपॉन थीटा नो आई पुट द वेल्यूज इन दिस इक्वेशन आई राइट आर इज इक्वल टू द वेल्यू ऑफ एल इज वन पॉइंट टू सेवन सिक्स एंड टू टेन रेस टू द पावर सेवन मीटर अपॉन द वेल्यू ऑफ थीटा विच इज जीरो पॉइंट जीरो थ्री थ्री टू रेडियंस आफ्टर कैलकुलेशन आई गेट थ्री पॉइंट एट फाइव एंड टू टेन रेस टू द पावर एट मीटर दस द डिस्टेंस बिटवीन द अर्थ एंड द मून इज थ्री पॉइंट एट फाइव इंटू टेन रेस टू द पावर एट मीटर देर फोर वी से दैट पेरालेक्स मेथड इज यूज टू मेजर लार्ज डिस्टेंस हेंस नोटेड डाउन दिस इंपॉर्टेंट कंसेप्ट रिमेंबर दैट आई विल स्कीप सम इजी कंसेप्ट लाइक मेजरमेंट्स ऑफ टाइम एंड मास बिकॉज दे आर सुपर इजी एंड यू कैन लर्न दैम जस्ट बाई रीडिंग दैम no we will learn error in measurement remember that there is always some sort of error in measurement we cannot eliminate it completely but we can minimize its effect here you must learn that what is an error in measurement well consider this pencil let the actual value of the pencil is 5 cm no i ask you to find its length using meter skill let you measure that the length of this pencil is 4 cm here there are two values actual length and measure length i mean actual length is 5 cm and measure length is 4 cm there is difference between actual length and measure length This difference between actual length and measure length is called an error in measurement. I mean there is 1 cm error in your measurement. Therefore we define an error as the difference between measured value and actual value is called an error. Let me repeat it. The difference between measured value and actual value is called an error. this we say that there is 1 cm error in your measurement now we will learn some important types of error the first one is random error and the second one is systematic error firstly we will understand the concept of random error which a lot of students are not understanding let consider that you are writing a research paper and suddenly you hear a blast or noise due to which you do not concentrate and you make an error now this error or disturbance is caused by external source or noise we call this error as random error therefore we define random error as the uncertain disturbances occur in the experiment is called random error for example consider this thermometer let one person reads it 27.5 degree centigrade and another person reads it 27.8 degree centigrade there is an error in taking reading which is called random error the random error occurs due to disturbance caused by external are unknown source now how can we eliminate random error well by taking large number of observations 
and then taking their average. By this way, we can eliminate random error. Hence, note it down this important type of error. On the other hand, the systematic error reminds me that there is error in the system. Consider this system. Let there is a hole at the bottom. Here, I am interested to fill this object. But the waters leak out from it due to the hole at the bottom. It means that there is error in the system due to which the system cannot be filled. This error in the system is called systematic error. Therefore, we define systematic error as the error arises due to the incorrect calibration of the device is called systematic error. For example, consider this clock. Let it is always 5 minutes fast. So every time you check the time, you will get a wrong time. It is because there is error in the clock which we call systematic error. Now how can we eliminate systematic error? Well, the best way to eliminate systematic error is to select better instruments and improving experimental techniques. Thus remember that systematic error means error in the system like this clock. Hence note it down this important concept of systematic error. Now I will teach you calculation of errors. The first one is absolute error. The concept of these errors seems boring. Once I do some sort of numerical problems, then you will master them. So watch it completely. To learn absolute error, you must learn two important terms. Measured values and true value. Let I measure time. Like A1, a2, A3, A4 and A5. These are called measured values. Now I take mean or average of these values. I write A mean is equal to A1 plus A2 plus A3 plus A4 plus A5. Here are total 5 values. I divide it by 5. Now listen carefully. This A mean of these values is called true value. Let me repeat it. This A mean of these values is called true value. Thus remember that true value is nothing but the mean or average of measured values. Here this A1 or A2 is individual value of the measurement. Now what is absolute error? Well, absolute error is equal to individual value minus true value. Remember that we represent absolute error by delta. The absolute error of A1 is del A1 is equal to A1 minus A mean. The absolute error of A2 is del A2 is equal to A2 minus A mean. The absolute error of A3 is del A3 is equal to a3 minus A mean and then del A4 is equal to A4 minus A mean, del A5 is equal to A5 minus A mean. Therefore, we define absolute error as the difference between individual value and true value is called absolute error. Thus remember that absolute error means when we subtract true value from individual value. Here, you must learn mean absolute error. By mean absolute error, I mean taking average of absolute error. We know that absolute error is denoted by del. All measurement is A. I take its mean. So this delta A mean means mean absolute error. It is equal to mod of absolute error of A1 plus mod of absolute error of A2 plus mod of absolute error of A3 plus mod of absolute error of A4 and plus mod of absolute error of A5. There are total 5 values. I divide it by 5. Thus this is known as 
mean absolute error. Now the second one is relative error. To learn a relative error, we again need to understand two terms, true value and mean absolute error. We know that true value is the average or mean of all measured values and it is A mean. Well, mean absolute error is equal to del A mean. Now listen carefully. Relative error is equal to mod of mean absolute error upon mod of true value. We know that mean absolute error is del A mean. I write del A is equal to del A mean upon A mean. Thus this is the term of relative error. Therefore, we define relative error as the ratio of mean absolute error to the ratio of true value is called a relative error. Hence note it down. Lastly, the third one is percentage error. It is super easy. We define percentage error as when relative error is represented as percentage, it is called percentage error. We know that Relative error is equal to mod of mean absolute error upon mod of true value. Here, if I take percentage of this relative error, it becomes percentage error. So this is the equation of percentage error. Hence note down all these important concepts which I will use in the next numerical problem. Now let's consider this numerical problem. In successive measurement of period of oscillation of pendulum, the reading turned out to be 2.54 second, 2.4 seconds and 2.70 seconds. Calculate absolute error, relative error and percentage error. Well, I write the given data. A1 is equal to 2.54 seconds, A2 is equal to 2.40 seconds and A3 is equal to 2.70 seconds. Firstly, I find absolute error. We know that absolute error is equal to measured value and true value. Also, we know that true value is equal to average of measured values. A mean is equal to A1 is 2.54 seconds plus A2 is 2.40 seconds plus A3 is 2.70 seconds upon there are three measured values I divide it by three after calculation I get 2.55 seconds now the absolute error of A1 is del A1 is equal to A1 minus A mean A1 is 2.54 minus A mean is 2.55 I get minus 0.01 second. The absolute error del A2 is equal to A2 minus A mean. A2 is 2.40 seconds and A mean is 2.55 seconds. I get minus 0.15 seconds. The absolute error del A3 is equal to A3 minus A mean. A3 is 2.70 seconds and A mean is 2.55 and A mean is 2.55 seconds. I get 0.15 seconds. Thus these are the values of absolute error. Now I will find the mean absolute error. Mean absolute error del A mean is equal to mod of del A1 plus mod of del A2 plus mod of del A3 upon 3. We already calculated the absolute error of A1, A2 and A3. Remember that I take only positive values of absolute error because mean absolute error is the mod of these values. I write del A1 is plus 0 0.01 second. A2 is 0 0.1 seconds and A3 is 0.15 seconds upon 3. After calculation, I get del A mean is equal to plus minus 
zero point one zero. This mean absolute error is plus minus zero point one zero. Now we will calculate relative error. We know that it is equal to del a is equal to mean absolute error upon true values. We already know that mean absolute error is zero point one zero. While true value is two point five, I get zero point zero four. Thus, the relative error is zero point zero four. Finally, we will calculate percentage error. Percentage error is mean absolute error upon true value and two hundred. The mean absolute error is zero point one zero upon the true value is two point five. In two hundred, after calculation, I get four percent. So percentage error is four percent. Therefore, using this formula, we can easily calculate absolute error, mean absolute error, relative error, and percentage error. I hope that you have mastered the chapter of units and measurement.